The gospel is the gospel of St. Luke. At chapter 24, we begin at verse 36. Now, as they said these things, you might wonder what things are being said. Cleopas and an unknown disciple have met Jesus on the road to Emmaus, but they don't know it's Jesus. And so they describe their sorrow. And he says, verse 25, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He goes on, and in the breaking of the bread is known. And in the breaking of the bread, listen to this. He took bread, blessed, and broke it and gave to them. Doesn't that remind you of the Lord's Supper? And in that, the breaking of the bread, their eyes are opened. And they go back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples that they have met the Lord on the road. So they rose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, found the eleven, and those who were with them gathering together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Now, that resurrection appearance isn't recorded, it's just referenced. And then Cleopas and the unknown disciples say, And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable, or in the name of Christ become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our redeemer. Amen. You need to understand about me and uh, my love life that I am at core a very immature little boy. I love scaring Miss Debbie. We were in the store the other day and I was uh, walking around in my new shoes. And by the way, I'm disappointed. Nobody has noticed that I wore new shoes. Or if you had noticed, nobody said, can you run real fast in them? They used to ask me that at church. Of course, I was six or seven at the time. But anyway, we were in the store, and she didn't notice I was behind her. And so I followed her around, just looking and looking. I finally walked up behind her and went, Hah! And she, ah! Where did I get that from? As they're talking about Jesus, Jesus himself, pop, stood in the midst of them. And said to them, peace to you. And I'm thinking, not likely. Let's cut the disciples some slack. Your best friend has died. You've gone to the funeral. You're back home grieving deeply. And suddenly, he appears. What would your response be? Especially if he said peace to you and you're thinking, not likely. Is this a vision? Have I lost it? Is this a ghost? I would remind you, we just recited that oldest of the historic Christian creeds. And the next to the last line says, I believe in the resurrection of of the dead. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's easy to say in church when everything's going well, but when you're standing when you're standing in the graveyard, when you're standing at home alone missing that person, it's a lot harder to say I believe in the resurrection of the dead. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? I'm sorry, my response would be, duh. I mean, why are you troubled? You know, you're in front, you're dead. Why are you troubled? 
And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. The scars of Jesus prove his identity. And any time you follow a Savior, you better make sure the hands are nail-scarred. They're still nail-scarred. There are people that want to offer salvation today, but the Savior they offer is not crucified. And the salvation they offer is not crucified. What did Jesus say to those who would follow? Take up your cross and what? Put it away? Follow me? Get in line. I take a step, you take a step. There are people who are saying, no, you know, search for your best life. Well, this is the best life, but unless the hands are nail scarred, don't trust the Savior. Unless you're being called to a crucified life, don't trust that salvation. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Now, this abrupt appearance of the Savior is recorded in other Gospels. And this is as far as the other Gospels will go. That, that in John's Gospel, he offers to let them touch and see. Luke is a physician. He wallows in the description of that Jesus offers. I mean, he literally just rolls around in it. I'm not saying he's making anything up. I'm saying he's not omitting what the others just sort of pass by. Hear what the physician says about Jesus' digestion. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, but while they still did not believe for joy, That sentence means it sounded too good to be true. While they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. You have to stop and think, isn't there food in heaven? Why is he showing up here bumming a meal? And he took it and ate it in their presence. Why does a physician talk about the digestive tract of the Savior? The scars prove the identity. The digestion proves life. We don't just serve a Savior. He who was dead is, current tense, alive. And, and not just in our memory. And not just spiritually. As we say in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And I tell you, only after you've been to the funeral home a couple of times and, and buried a few loved ones can you actually understand the impact of that statement. One of our core identities as Christians is, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. Not whistling in the dark, walking through the graveyard, but alive. And did you notice that Jesus gives everything they need in order to believe? It's not just an appearance. It's an appearance. It's physically handling a body. And it's Jesus eating in front of them. I love the little point that he asks for fish. It's like he's gone down to little Josh's. He's asked for fish. And they give him what? Fish and honeycomb. Well, just in case it is the Savior, we're going to sweeten you up some. I appreciate whoever it was that left me the candy this morning in the pulpit. Going to sweeten up the Savior. Leaves fish and honeycomb. 
and in front of them he eats. Our Savior gives us everything we need. Why does it take so much? The answer is you can resist God. Up until they'd seen him eat, it sounded too good to be true. Up until they had handled his body, they weren't sure that really was Jesus. But in spite of all they've been offered, some people still won't believe over in the Acts of the Apostles. There's a woman by the name of Rhoda. Peter's in jail, and they pray for Peter's release. And as they're praying, as the prayer meeting is going on, Acts 12, verse 15, there's a knock. Rhoda goes to the door, opens the door. They've been praying for Peter's release. Guess who's in front of her? Peter. She shuts the door saying, it's his ghost. Can you imagine what heaven would be like for that poor lady? <laughs> you know, for the first 10,000 years, they're going to be making fun of her. But, you know, God gives all we need, but sometimes we still refuse to receive it. Or we think the answer is explained some other way. It's a vision. It's something else. All this is introductory, by the way, to get to the main point in today's scripture. After he's done all of this, he says... Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. You understand that? This is not a new beginning. This is a continuation of what God has already been doing. Not only is it a continuation, it's a fulfillment. He has told them, he has referred to Hebrew Scripture, which has told them. Luke's point is that Jesus himself is the culmination of everything the Bible offers. And not only that, Jesus is the best interpreter of Scripture. Back when I was a student in a previous century, at Emory, I was in Whitehall one day hitting the coffee machine. That coffee machine was my best friend for three years. I was in there hitting the coffee machine. It was a Sunday afternoon. I was studying. And uh, a fellow from the business school came up and said, Why do you Christians steal our Bible? And that's when I realized this guy's Jewish. And I looked at him and said, what? Why do you Christians steal our Bible? Now, I don't remember having a good answer in those days. But according to this text, we didn't steal it. We're just continuing it. We're just going on from where it started. that all the things must be fulfilled, which were written in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Can I tell you that's a spiritual condition? He opened their mind. When you're ready to receive, God is ready to give. But if you're not ready to receive... It's not happening. And there are times that you will tell people about what the Lord has done in your life, and they blow it off. They're not ready to receive. That doesn't mean you get a get-out-of-jail-free card. No, you, you, you continue bearing witness. But understand, you have to be in the position to receive. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures, then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary 
for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. The idea of the Christ suffering is not just a little ouch. It's all that happens from the time Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem and is betrayed and is arrested and is beaten and whipped and all of that up through the cross and the empty tomb. It's necessary. Why? God's got to do something. I love how Paul puts it over in 1 Corinthians 15. So also it is with the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. You get the image? A human as a is a seed planted in the ground, sown in corruption, raised in incorruption, sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. By the way, that spiritual body likes fish. God will have to do a work if that works in me. I don't like fish. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, this is where I want you to wake up. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterwards the spiritual. The first man was of the earth. By the way, there's a play on words there, a little joke there God has. You know, Adam literally means one drawn from the earth. It's earth and earthling is the play on words there. God likes humor. The first man was of the earth, made of the dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as the man of dust, so also are those made of dust. As is the heavenly man, so are those who are heavenly. Jesus is the second Adam comes to reverse that curse. And it's his perfect obedience on the cross that opens the way. His perfect obedience reverses the disobedience we saw in Adam. Now, when Adam was tempted, he did not do every sin. But he made the way for every sin to be done. Jesus wasn't tempted by every sin, but he was tempted in, Scripture says, in every way as we are, yet without sin. He's the key that opens the jail that keeps us bound up. And that's Easter. That's salvation. That is the resurrection. And that repentance and remission, the word there means release to freedom, remission of sins, release to be free of sins, should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. The sermon is this, you are witnesses of these things. If you can't witness to these things, you really have to question, is Jesus my Savior? It starts where you are. They're in Jerusalem. It starts in Jerusalem. But can I tell you, the gospel is set free, and it goes outward, ever outward. And you, your witnesses, either of the Savior, or of the lack of salvation. 
In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.